I will share my screen. So I wanted to just start off today by kind of um, uh, talking about where we are and where I think we can go. Um, so this is the second time I've done this series of lessons and I'm always like pretty overly ambitious about what can get done. And I think it's probably a good idea just to um, not be stressed out about keeping up with a particular schedule, but rather to take our time, relax. Um, that's probably better for me because I'm not that advanced of an R user. And if I get in too rushed, I will get myself flustered. So anyway, I'll, we can sort of take our time. I went ahead and just split data wrangling into two sessions. And so um, what, what I'll try to do is finish what was scheduled for last week in terms of data wrangling. And then I have actually an exercise involving a real data set that's kind of a, a challenge. And so I thought we would start working on that. It's unlikely that we'll finish with that work but we won't worry about that. You can chip away at, at it on your own. And I'm thinking that I may um, just add an optional session seven the week uh, after the last scheduled week. And then it's like during exam time. But if anybody um, wants, we can just kind of hash through whatever we don't have time to do. And if people have questions or particular problems they wanna work on, we can, we can work on it then. So we'll try to just not be um, uh, too worried about that. Just a second. Okay, uh, sorry. So if you look at the schedule for today, I sent in, in my email um, some information about down downloading um, the data set from ICTSR. So we won't get to that until the very end. If you didn't have time to do it, don't worry about it, just relax. Um, we'll go ahead and start with the, um, the R script for lesson two, um, or the part two of this lesson. And then when, if or when we finish that, there are two versions of the, uh, the next script. So there is probably most people will want to use the one with the answers, but I also have what I call the practice script. So I'm going to sort of lay out what it is that we're trying to accomplish with this complicated data set. And if you want to try to see, to see how to figure out how to do it on your own, you can start with the starter script and try coding on that. And then if you get stuck, you can look at the, the script that has the answers in it. So that's the strategy that I'm going for today. Um, so I guess without further ado, we can go ahead and jump right on in where we left off last week. Um, so yeah, I mentioned downloading the ICPSR data. Um, there's only two files that we actually need from there. And um, Brian was talking to me about this earlier. Um, when you, so I think one common thing that people do is just download all the data. There's like a whole bunch of, I don't know, 22 different data sets. We don't need all of that. And it's like a big download. Um, but because of that sort of mode, when you say you want to download the data set, they basically give you a wrapper that has the same name regardless of what data sets you download. So there's like a zip file that wraps up all of the metadata. So when you do the second download, it's going to use the same zip file name. So just call it some other name. And then when you open them up, you'll have an opportunity to pull the two tab separated value files, the actual data files out of the zip. Those are our names, uh, the names that I put here. And if you go to the, um, the link that's on the lessons homepage, it gives you all of the gory details of exactly what you need to do to get that data set. Okay, so um, we talked about tibbles. And um, one of the things that uh, I don't think I actually said is that it's, that, well, I did say that tibbles are basically kind of like a vanilla data frame. There are data frames with kind of relaxed rules. There are not rules of so many rules about column names and also it doesn't do any kind of automatic things to the data. It doesn't automatically turn character strings 
into factors. So, you know, if you have a tibble and you want a column of character strings to be a factor, you can always do that explicitly, but it doesn't do that for you automatically. So one of the things that I'm not so sure about is like, in what situations does it actually matter whether you have a standard data frame or a tibble? A lot of the things that I've tried to do that I thought, oh wow, I'm gonna have to have a standard data frame, just ended up working anyway with the tibble. So I haven't taken the time to be sort of systematic about that. But basically, I think most of the time you can just use tibbles um, and then if you have some problem, you can try to uh, figure out if there's something that you're not doing like turning I know for some statistical tests, certain columns have to be factors. And so if you run into problems with your tests not working or the, the wrong thing being selected, you may have to uh, look at whether your columns are in the correct um, format. Several lessons ago, um, somebody asked me, what happens if the data is not in the form that you want it in? So for example, what if you only want certain columns or what if you only want certain rows or what if you need to create new columns from other columns? Those are the kinds of things we're going to talk about. And there's some pretty powerful packages built for working, basically wrangling or munging data in tibbles. And diplier, which is, uh, there was a previous library called Plyr, P-L-Y-R, and I'm not sure what the D is for, but anyway, this is sort of like an advanced version of that. And there's three functions in the diplayer package that we're going to be looking at. So filter is the one that you use if you only want to take a subset of rows in a, in a data frame, a tibble. Select is what you use if you want to only use certain columns. And then mutate is what you use if you either want to calculate additional new columns or if you want to change existing columns. And we'll see examples of how to do that using the school's data set. So I'm going to jump over to my R Studio. Um, this is the lesson five R script, Wrangle 2. Um, <clears throat> so just to uh, give you some additional uh, resources, if you want to read up some more about how to do data transformations, the um, Hadley Wickham book that's free online that I recommended last time has a chapter on data transformations with a lot of nice pictures and things like that. So if you want to go in deeper on this, I'm really just scratching the surface on how to do basic things, but you can refer to that chapter if you want to know more details of how to do things. Um, if you have the Tidyverse library successfully installed on your computer, you can just give the library tidyverse command and that's the only command you'll need basically for the rest of today's lesson. It loads pretty much all of the libraries that we're going to use. Uh, my R studio is broken and I can't get tidyverse to work so I have to actually load the individual libraries um, separately. So I'm going to go ahead and run the first line to load the deployer package and then um, as you may recall we talked about two different read CSV functions. The one that's read.csv reads a CSV file in as a, but as a regular data frame, but read underscore CSV um, comes from uh, one of the uh, packages. Boy, now I hope I have it loaded. Uh, I may have to go back and load that one because I hacked off the top part of the script. Well, we'll find out. Anyway, when you use read underscore tibble, um, uh, Okay, let's see. Yep, it did it. Great. Okay. Um, so it reads it in as a tibble. And if I want to see column information, remember the STR column gives us kind of a breakdown on all of the different uh, things that are in a, a particular um, function. So, uh, how did that not work? Oh because I didn't, I selected only the word STR. I, I didn't select the whole line. That was my mistake. Okay, so here's a breakdown of the school's data, which we've already worked on before. Here's all the columns. Here's what kind of things are in them. Notice that none of them, this, the character ones, none of them are factors. So again, this is how we know it's just a generic tibble. 
It also tells you things like whether if the columns have numbers, whether they're integers or double precision and various things like that. All right, so basically we just confirmed that we actually have loaded a tibble. So um, one of the things that, um, that you might want to do is to just pull particular rows based on some kind of criterion. Uh, so for example, if we only want to pull out the rows that um, are for, that have zip code values of 37212, which is like Hillsborough Village, then um, we can use a filter command. So the format of the filter command, the first thing, first argument you put in is the name of the tibble, which is uh, this tools tibble that we uh, just read in. And then the second, uh, after the comma, then you put the screening criterion. Okay, so I've said screen by zip code. Let's try running that. So we can see that um, it, uh, let's see, it tells me that the result is a two by two, um, let's see here, a two by two tibble, sorry, a two by 35 tibble. So the same 35 columns that I had before are there, but there are now only two rows Aiken Elementary and Harris Hillman that have zip codes that are 37212. So it did filter this um, as, I, as I requested. Um, we could also do a test for um, uh, based on a string, a character string instead of a number. So because it's a, a character string, I have to put it in quotation marks because it was treating zip code as a number, I didn't put it in quotation marks. So this, if I run this, it should locate only high schools. So, all right, we see again, there were 17 rows that had only high school in the school level column. We can also do um, more sophisticated things. So here's a tricky one uh, where, you know, some, some of the schools um, in the grade 12 column have NAs. So for example, all of the elementary schools um, would not have 12th graders in them. So this would actually be sort of another way to screen out high schools. If I just look for schools that, um, that don't have an NA for 12th grade. So this function is NA basically screens out, or it, it produces all the schools that have an NA. And then if I put this exclamation mark that stands for not, that basically negates it. So it turns it into all of the, um, the row, rows that do not have NAs in the grade 12 column. So if I run that, then I can see that one, I can see already that there's a slight difference here because special education schools like Harris Hillman have 12th graders, but they're not classified as high schools. So um, doing the search in the second way allowed me to find all the schools with 12th graders, even if they weren't explicitly called 12th graders. Now, so far, when we've been running this filter command, all we've done is just had the output um, show up in the console, which is the normal thing that happens in R if you don't assign the output to something. But we can use the assignment operator to assign the result into a new tibble. So if I wanted to create a new tibble that had only the high school rows, I could apply the same kind of filter I did before, but use the assignment operator like this. So if I do that, now you see that I've created a new tibble called high school. And if I look to see what's in it, I can see that it only has school levels that are high school. And if I wanted to, I could take that uh, result and save it in a file or some other thing like that. All right, any uh, questions about filter before we move on to selecting columns?
All right. Well, one of our little dog friends apparently has a question, but I don't know how to help that. So <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, no problem. I wish I had a dog. Um, okay. So um, we saw how to select the columns of the uh, or the rows of the table. If we want to pick out particular columns, we can do that with the um, select uh, function. So just to remind ourselves, here's all the columns that we have in the table. Um, and so we can pick out uh, particular columns by listing them by name. So as was the ca case in the um, filter, the very first argument that you put in the function is the name of the tibble that you want to work on. And then you put a comma. And then everything after the first comma are the uh, Col the names of the columns that you want to um, use. Now, one thing, remember I said that um, tibbles are not really picky about column names. So when we use the read.csv and read in um, columns from this table, uh, from this CSV file, if the column headers had any spaces in it, it replaced them with spaces. But tibbles, when you read a tibble in, it doesn't do anything to the column headers. So a column header like school year um, does not, uh, it, it still has a space in it. So the way that you indicate that a column header has a, a space in it and that you're not talking about two separate columns is to use backticks, which on most keyboards is in your upper left, not to be confused with a single uh, quote or an apostrophe. So this is a backtick. So if I want to just list them like I did here, this will give me only the uh, male and female columns. If I do a column name with a colon in between, uh, two column names with a colon in between, then it'll select all the columns in the tibble between those two columns. So if I run that, I see um, I get everything between school year and zip code. Uh, I can also use other selection criteria. And just one example is I can use uh, starts with. So for example, um, in the uh, tibble, you'll notice that there's a bunch of columns that start with grades like grade K, grade one, grade two, grade three. Um, and they are all in a row, so I could do them as a range. But if I wanted to, I could alternatively just use the starts with function. And that basically finds all the column headers that start with uh, the, the character string grade. So if I run that, you can see that I get grade pre-K, grade K, grade one, and so forth. Um, there are many, many other ways that you so could select columns. And I, I can't even scratch the surface in one lesson. Um, so I would recommend, as I said, uh, going to the online book of Hadley Wickham's. The other thing which I don't think that I mentioned before, and I probably should have, is that if you take any kind of function or, or command in, um, in R and you put a question mark in front of it and execute that, then it opens up a help uh, window or a, it opens up a, a help file for that particular function. And it shows up in this pane over here where we saw the package manager and plots and things like that. So if you want to, if you don't want to look it up in the book, um, there's all the details. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, I won't go into that. But that's just a way that you can basically find out information without having to go to Google or look it up in a book. Any questions or thoughts about um, select? So did you say we have to load that DPLYR separately, or is it included in the tidyverse if our tidyverse is working? If, you, if tidyverse is working, you should not have to, you should just be able to say library tidyverse. Is, is that working for you? Yes, that was working. OK, perfect. But yeah. I, did, I did both because I wasn't sure. So. Yeah, it doesn't actually hurt to do both. Um, and like I said, mostly for my benefit, you know, what I would do in the normal situation is just at the top of my script put 
library tidyverse and I would be done. But because um, my computer doesn't work, I put in all of these individual ones. Also just to make you aware that there are, that tidyverse is actually a bunch of different packages. Um, but yeah, it doesn't hurt to load too. All right, well, let's talk about mutate. So mutate does the third thing that I talked about, which is to um, either create new columns from existing columns or to, uh, to um, create a whole new tibble that includes existing columns and newly created columns. So you can basically um, add them on, add columns, by calculating, replace columns by calculating what you'll see in a minute, or create a new tibble with the extra columns. So um, the first variation on this, it, just the straight um, mutate, will add the newly calculated column onto the end of the tibble. So as has been the case in I think pretty much every function that we're gonna use today, the very first argument is the name of the tibble that you wanna operate on, and then there's a comma. And then the next thing that you put is um, the calculation for how you want to create the new column. So if I create, if I want to, so one of the deficiencies we talked about before is that the, the school data does not um, have a total number of students for the school. So if we want to normalize by anything, like by the total number of students, we have to calculate that out. So if I say the formula is male plus female, it just does a pairwise addition of every row in the column. And then it takes that sum and puts it into a new column that's at the end of the table called total students. So let's go ahead and try that. So because this is a very large tibble, it only shows me the details of the first one. But if I look at the listing of all of the other um, ones that it wasn't able to show me, you can see that there is a new one at the end called total students. <clears throat> um, and let's see, I think, let's see, what did I do with two? schools tibble? If I look at schools tibble, oh, yeah. Okay, so one of the things is I didn't assign this to anything, so it didn't actually change schools tibble it just simply did the operation and showed it to you. So if you want to do um, a transformation um, and you want to create like a new tibble that, um, that contains the new column plus other ones, there's another command called uh, transmutate. And so again, for transmutate, you put the name of the tibble in here and then you say what, so uh, I, I, get, I think I should have said that I could have used the assignment operator to put this uh, mutate into a new tibble if I wanted to, like I'm doing here. Um, the difference between mutate and transmutate is that mutate always sticks the new column, it always keeps all the existing columns and sticks the new one on the end. Transmutate allows you to just subset part of the data. So when you do transmutate, you can take existing columns, um, and I think you can specify them as individual columns. I think you can also specify them as ranges. Um, so, uh, so I can take the school name column that, as it already exists, and then take my uh, newly calculated total students column and have it be inserted right after school name, and then also include the economically disadvantaged column. So if I do that, we can see uh, it created a new tibble, uh, and here it is, let's see, called a small data set. So now you can see it just has the three columns, existing school name, existing economically disadvantaged, but it also added in my new column. Uh, so this is like really going to be really useful when we work with this other this data set that I asked you to download because it's just massive. Um, and in fact, it's so big that my computer was struggling with just loading it. So it's definitely nice to be able to do this kind of subsetting. Uh, now, so this is basically uh, several ways that we can add new columns. 
We can also take an existing column and, um, and create and change it in several ways. So one thing that I can do, like, as you may recall, we said that, that having zip code being like a number really doesn't make any sense because really a zip code is a way of categorizing things. There's no meaning to the value. So this is a case where it actually might be nice for our tibble to have zip code as a factor. So if we use the factor function, we can just simply take the zip code column from the school tibble, turn it into a factor, and then write it, assign it right back into the tibble as the same column. So it's just basically going to replace the zip code column as a number with the zip code column as a tibble. So if I run this and then do the str function again, now if I look down here, I can see that, um, that zip code is now a factor with 26 levels instead of being a string. And that's exactly what I want if I want it to be a category. You can also use the um, mutate command uh, with replace. And so um, this is the format for that. So you put the name of the tibble and then you say you put the name of the column that you want to replace, and then uh, you say uh, the source column, and then you calculate out the uh, what it is that you want to replace it with. So I'm going to say um, so. The condition here is every row that has elementary school in it. That's my condition here. I want that to be changed to primary school. And I want to do that on the school level column. And I want to take the result of that and put it right back into my table as school column. And there's, a, there's several other ways to do this, but this is the one that's sort of included in tidyverse. So if I run this, now if I look here, um, in the school level column, every school that used to be called elementary school is now called primary school, but the middle schools and the high schools didn't get changed. So again, this is just a drop in the bucket in terms of all the different ways that you can um, change columns. And uh, so I'll just direct you to the resources that I've linked to here if you have more complicated things you want to do or if you want to know the details about these commands here. I mean, so just to be sort of like honest here, there are so many functions in R that until you use it a lot, I basically, I can't remember what they all are or how to use them. So either you spend a lot of time looking them up or in Googling them, or the other thing that's good is to just keep your scripts. So after you've laboriously created a script where you figured out how to do something, then I just go back to the script and say, okay, now how did I do that last time? I mean, obviously at a certain point, you'll get good enough that you'll hopefully be able to remember. Uh, but at this point, I am not really good enough to be able to, um, to remember all of the um, commands. So uh, yeah, anybody have anything they want to ask about uh, changing columns? I won't promise I'll be able to answer it. <laughs> All right, well, let's march on then. If people um, are okay with this. Uh, okay, I just suddenly lost and regained my mouse. I'm not sure why. Okay, uh, so let's talk about joins. So the other thing, besides manipulating a particular table, the other problem that's like a really common problem is to have data that's in two separate tables that you want to join together. If you've ever tried to like manually do this in Excel, ugh, it is just a nightmare. You have to like sort the columns and make sure they're lined up. And um, Well, it turns out that um, R has uh, some very powerful functions called join. 
And joins, it, join is a term that comes from the database world. So if you're into relational databases, this will be very familiar to you. So basically, uh, a join process is merging together two tables on the basis of some common val uh, values that they have. So the key is the term for the columns that you're using to match table rows. So the, uh, the best case scenario is that every single row has this, all of the same values in the column that you want to use, the columns that you want to use to match them up. So for example, like uh, typically this column will have some kind of identifier in it, like a social security number or a VUNet ID or something that is unique for whatever the entity is that you're talking about in the row. But oftentimes that's not the case. Sometimes the one table will have rows that aren't in the other table and vice versa. So the complication on a joins is on how do you handle these cases where you have rows that don't match up. So there's a bunch of different varieties called like left joins and right joins and so on. But we're just going to talk about two, inner join and full outer join. In the case of an inner join, you're basically saying if the data in the, if I don't have data in both of the tables, I don't care. I'll just ignore the data that doesn't match up. So an inner join produces an output that only links the two tables together if they have a, a matching key. The full outer join is sort of like the opposite of that. So the full outer join would say, well, I don't want to lose any of the data that I have in these two tables. So even if one table has information about something that the other one does, I still want to keep that information. So in a full outer join, it matches up any rows that have matching key values. But if there are rows that don't match up, it just basically creates new rows in the, in the output table for both of them. And then any values that are missing for the one table are put into the other table as NAs. So as you can see in this example, the table on the right does not have any key number three. So it just creates NA values for all the values in the table on the right where there isn't any uh, row with a key of number three. And the same thing is true with the table on the left. And there's a whole lot of other permutations on this. Uh, like I said, depending on like if, if you only want to keep values from the left table or from the right table, but I'll leave that to you to look up. Again, Hadley Wickham's book has a whole um, chapter on dealing with relational um, data with a lot of different examples. So I'm just going to uh, talk for a moment about the format of the, of the join command using a, a full outer join. So, uh, and the format for the other kinds of joins, like inner joins and left joins, is basically the same, except that you replace the keyword with uh, inner join instead of full join. So as we saw in all the other commands we've looked at, the very first argument you have to put in the function is the name of the tibble that you want to use. <clears throat> and then um, you, uh, oh, actually, sorry, you put the two uh, tables that you want to join together, that were the two tibbles. So in this case, example, we're gonna use it some uh, data from the World Bank on women and also some data on poverty. So like if we wanna know about poverty data relating to women's data, we could join those two together. And I'm gonna join them by the country name. Now in the women's data table, uh, the country names are in a column called country, but in the poverty data, table there in a column called country name. And so <clears throat> I create a vector that has a, um, a sequence of the columns that I want to match up. And since I only want them to match by one column, I only have one item in, the, in this construct vector here. And then um, there's some, uh, some other things that I don't want to get into. But the last thing is, um, <clears throat> If you, uh, um, if you create 
in your final table, if the, the uh, two tables you're joining have column headers that are the same, um, you can use the suffix uh, argument to be able to differentiate uh, which one came from which table. So what it'll do if I say dot .wam and dot .pov, if there's a column that's the, that has the same name in the women's data table and the poverty table, it'll add dot .wom on the column in the women's table and dot .pov in the column that came from the poverty data. So that's just a way to make sure that you're, that in the final result, you end up with columns that have unique names. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Um, okay, so uh, there is a, so I put the source data here uh, where I got this from. However, I had to do some cleanup on the data before it was directly importable into R. So, and I put those data onto GitHub so that we could just read them in as a CSV file. Um, so before I do this, I'm gonna just go ahead and, and clean things up here to make it a little less confusing. So let's read in the women's data. Okay, and this is what it looks like. So here's the country column, and then there's a bunch of stuff about life expectancy, uh, which percentage of women have seats in parliament and all kinds of interesting things like that. And then the poverty data, I can load that in and it looks like this. So again, here's the country name column uh, and then there's things like um, poverty data from different years, like what fraction of people were in poverty, I think mostly is, is what it is. Now, really country name is not a very great way to do the matching because like if capitalization is off or if, if there's misspelling or somebody uses like an ampersand for Barbada and, or for Antigua and Barbuda, then they're not gonna match. But unfortunately, the women's data table only has country names. If it had country codes, that would probably be a better thing to use for the join, but we're pretty much stuck with the data that we have. So if I do, uh, so here is my command for doing the, the outer join. And I, again, I'm having to match the two tables up uh, by the country columns. Okay, and then- um, A question. I, yes. Sorry, what does the copy equals false do? Uh, I don't remember what that is, actually. I'd have to look in the documentation, sorry. Okay. Oh, answer right. that. Um, but uh, okay, so in order to be able to see how these two things are different, there's a, a command called arrange, and I'm just going to have it arrange the joined outer data tibble by the country column. It's basically going to alphabetize them for us. Uh, okay, so if I look at, uh, let's see, outer sorted data, now they're in alphabetical order. So I'm going to do the same thing for the inner join, uh, read the columns in, and then sort them. And then if we look at, so um, era, the, the name Arab world is only found in the poverty data. It's not found in the women's data. So if we look at the, um, the outer join sorted data, we'll see that, um, for Ar the Arab world row, that the all of the women's data column have MA in it, but the poverty data exists there. If we then um, look at the inner sorted data, we can see that the row for Arab world just isn't there. So again, this followed the rules that I was talking about on an inner join if there's no matching rows, you just dump them. So this would be the kit, like if you're gonna do an analysis that requires you to have all the data, then there's no reason necessarily to, um, to do an outer join. But if you wanna sort of preserve all the data, then it's probably better to do an outer join. And, and a lot of times since functions will not operate, if there's missing data anyway, sometimes it doesn't matter whether you do the outer join because your analysis will just ignore the data that doesn't match up anyway. 
All right, so that is a um, kind of quick and dirty look at, uh, at inner and outer joins. And um, so what I wanna talk about the last thing today is pipes. And I can see that we probably are not even gonna get to the, um, the ICPSR data. So we may just end up saving that for the last day. Um, but let's talk about pipes. Pipes are not actually an original part of um, R. They are added as a part of a package called Magritter. Um, and if you read the documentation, you're apparently supposed to pronounce this with a fake French accent like Magritteur or something like that. I'm, I'm not sure what the deal is with that. You can read up if you're curious. Um, but let uh, the um, the basic idea uh, go away. The basic idea behind piping is that um, it's an easier way if you if you have a series of operations that you keep wanting to do on your data set, like run it through the first function and then run it through the second function, then run it through the third function. It's really kind of clunky if you do it in like the classic way. So in the classic way, you take your data, you put it in a function, then the data that comes out, you store it in a variable. Then you take the data from that variable, you dump it in the second function, you do some operation on it, and you put it in another variable. Then you take the value from that variable, and you dump it into the third function, and then you take the output and you put it into that variable. Well, these two intermediate buckets here are really pretty useless. The only purpose for them is simply to just hold the data until we have time to dump it into the next function. And so what um, piping does is it basically allows you to skip that intermediate step. What you do is you say, all right, I'm gonna dump the data in the first function. And then whatever spews out of the first function goes directly into the second function without storing it anywhere. And then whatever goes out of the second function goes directly into the third function. And so if you could think of it as like connecting the functions with pipes, so I guess that's maybe why they call it piping. Um, but it essentially gets rid of the sort of intermediate storage tanks if you wanna think about it that way. So the way that this works in the code, this is how you would write the code in sort of the classic um, way. You would take your data, let's say it's in, um, in a vector called w, and you would pass it into the function along with some parameters, uh, some argument p, and then it's gonna do something and you take the output and assign it into x uh, of another um, vector data structure called x. Then you take x, you plug it in the second a function with some other parameters, which we'll call q, uh, and then you take that result, you put it in Y, then you take whatever is in Y and you put it into the function C along with some argument that it needs called R, and then you take the output and you put it into Z. And so the P, uh, sorry, the, um, the X variable and the Y variable don't actually really do anything except to just, um, to just uh, hold the intermediate results. So the way piping works is you use this little symbol that is a uh, sort of like an arrow that has a percent sign and then a greater than sign and another percent sign. So it's designed to look like an arrow pointing to the right. And you can put pipes all in one line, but it gets kind of confusing if there's a lot of them. So it's typical to put them on a uh, to continue them onto the next line. So what I'm saying here is take what's in the vector w and pipe it into function a. Now you'll notice that when I wrote function a, I didn't have to put the, uh, the, the data structure name first followed by a comma. I basically skipped the first argument because as we saw in a lot of the functions that we use today, the first argument is usually the tibble or whatever it is that you're trying to do the operation on. So when you're using piping, you leave off the first argument and you just start putting in the second argument. So that would be P. And then you take the output of that 
you pipe it into function B, you take the output of that, you pump it, you um, pipe it into function C. And if all we put was just this piping part, then it would take the answer and it would show it on the screen. But if we actually <clears throat> want the output of the whole piping operation, <clears throat> excuse me, to end up stored in a, a data structure or a variable, then we use our normal uh, operation, our normal assignment operation to take the result of the pipe and then put it into the variable called z. And that's represented schematically here. So the very first thing that I'm piping is whatever's in variable a. So that's like dumping the first bucket in, run it through the pipe, it comes out into z, that's the last bucket, and all the intermediate ones that we had up here are not there. So how do you feel about this conceptually? Does that make sense? Or does anybody have any questions about that? It makes sense to me. Cool. Thanks. So piping is actually like, a, it's, kind, it's a relatively new thing, but it's become extremely popular because it's a way to make your code cleaner and also very, it's clear to see by reading through the code what's going on. You can see first do this, then this, then this, then this, and things are not mucked up with all of the extra assignment operators that are in here. So a lot of uh, coding languages now have piping available in them. So we'll wrap things up today with um, looking at the, uh, the school's data. So here, so what I'm gonna do is just describe a series of operations. First, as done using the classical um, method of, of assigning things into variables. So the, very, the first thing is to take the data from the web and put it into a tibble called schools dibble, tibble. Then the second thing that I'm gonna do is, uh, is to filter out um, only the rows that are in high school. So that's using the filter command that we saw. So this is gonna limit it to ro rows that are high schools. Then I'm gonna take that result, put it into the mutate function, and create this male plus female column at the end of the table called total students. And that output then gets put in a thing called data with total. Then I take data with total, I mutate it by going through and creating a new column called economically disadvantaged, which is gonna be normalized by dividing it by the total number of students. So instead of um, having uh, it be the whole numbers, it will be fractions. And I'm gonna do the same thing for limited English proficiency. I'm gonna divide by the total students. Then I'll take that, put it in a tibble called fractional. Then the, the last thing that I'm gonna do is to um, just select out the new columns that I made uh, from this fractional array. I'm gonna just keep the school name and then the total students, the percent, uh, economically disadvantaged and the percent English. So if I do this, you'll notice that um, when I run all of these different scripts, every time I do a line, I'm creating a new data frame. And so my global environment here is getting all clogged up with a bunch of data frames or a bunch of tibbles that I don't even care about. The only tibble that I really care about is the last one called output, which you can see just has the things I want. It has only high schools, and it has only total number of students and the percent economically advantaged in, in limited English. So um, the more straightforward way use, of doing this with pipes, um, let's see, let me scroll down here so you can compare. You can see that, um, again, I'm starting with the read CSV function, but instead of assigning it to a variable, I'm just piping it on to the next line with the pipe operator. And then I, I filter by high school, mutate the total column, create the fractional columns, and then just pull out the four columns that I want. And now let me clean this here again. When I run this line, it does them all at once. Uh, and now, and, and then here's the result. But if I want 
uh, remember, since I didn't use the assignment operator, it just dumps it onto the console. But if I actually want uh, to put it into here, then I have to uh, assign it to something else. So I'll go ahead and run this command. And now I've created this new table called summary. And uh, I can see that it has done exactly what I want. Uh, and then I can also um, add an extra line, this line here, to write it out to a CSV file. Uh, so anyway, that's, uh, we're basically out of time today. So next time we'll talk about ggplot, which is uh, awesome visualizations. And then anybody who's able and wants to play around with that data set, uh, the ICPSR data set, we can do that on the add-on week. So thanks, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording if my mouse will work. Uh, hmm.